you guys, but I'm a little warm. A little bit about uh, our pg and &E program. My name is Les Putnam. I work for pg and &E. um, pg and &E has been doing this for probably four years, probably right after San Bruno. So you uh, obviously, we have a connection with that. We started teaching um, firefighters and police officers about gas and electric safety, how to respond out there. We've expanded that to CERT program, so your neighborhood search uh, group. A little bit about the, uh, the program, again, it started after San Bruno. It's transitioned quite a bit. The people that are in the group are called public safety specialists. That's my job. Uh, we do several things. We respond to gas leaks and uh, situations to the field. And what we do is we meet up with the fire departments. We go to the incident command post and we liaison with them to bring them information about PG&E's needs and they also tell us about what their needs are. Uh, all of us that work in this uh, position are either retired police or fire, uh, firefighters. So I spent 32 years in the fire service. Actually uh, worked with Rod Harris at Berkeley Fire Department. Uh, it's good seeing him. It has been a while. But, uh, so I retired uh, two years ago, began working with pg and &E in this position as a public safety specialist. So that's kind of where we're at with the program. So again, we're going to talk about gas and electric uh, safety. And we're going to um, really focus on the CERT program working in pairs, talking about what you guys need to do and how to prepare for an earthquake event, something where we have either wires down, gas leaks, neighbors aren't home, you're going to canvas the neighborhood and try to make it safe before the fire department gets there. So um, let's get going with the, the first thing we want to tell you is our emergency number. This is uh, the number, it's on the back of the flip chart that I just gave you. This is the number that reaches our dispatch center. So as a CERT member, if you need to reach out and get a hold of PG&E because you have a situation, call this number. Please don't call this number because you want to find out about your bill or your smart meter or something like that. That's the one you're, uh, we don't want you to use this number for. Uh, but again, just use this number to get a hold of us. This is the same number we give to our fire departments. All right, a little bit about our natural gas. We don't make natural gas in California. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we bring this gas in and why we do the things that we do. Uh, these two major pipelines right here are what we call the backbone of our transmission system. So all the gas in California comes through these two major pipelines. Everything else spider webs off of this throughout the different neighborhoods, uh, and that's how you get your gas. We uh, ship the gas in from the north, from the uh, Ca uh, Canada area, the Rocky Mountain area also, and in the south we get it from the Texas oil fields and the Arizona area. Uh, the purple dots here are what we call compressor stations. These are basically a pop-up building. There's a large centrifugal compressor in the, in the building. It's driven by three jet engines. Uh, it runs 24 hours a day, and it's to keep the pressure up in the system so that the gas can flow to our customers. So that's uh, the emphasis of our, of our um, system is we need to have pressure inside the system right here. The San Bruno situation um, obviously occurred right in this area right here on our uh, five mile uh, transmission line, 36 inch line at 350 pounds, just so you know a little bit about that. We'll bring that in here because we're going to compare your gas in, in Walnut Creek to, to that because that's uh, an idea of what you'll be looking at if something happens uh, on a major transmission line in this area. We have a transmission system and a distribu distribution system. The transmission pipe is going to be our large steel pipe. It's going to range from 10 to 42 inches in diameter. It's always going to be in steel. The pressure on that pipe is going to start at 150 pounds and go all the way up to 900 pounds. There are two facilities in, our, uh, in the Bay Area where we have underground storage and the pressure in those areas exceeds 2,800 pounds. One is in Concord, quite far enough away from you, and the other is out in the uh, Delta area uh, in, on an island out in that area. Very safe way for us to uh, store gas. We store it in the summertime, and in the wintertime when we need it to keep the price even throughout the year, we bring that gas back in, into our system. It's about 150 billion cubic feet of gas at each one of these faci uh, facilities. Right. It's called McDonald Island. It's uh, right off between Stockton and Discovery Bay uh, right as you go head out for, uh, Highway 4 towards Stockton out there. Um, the distribution system is the plastic pipe that typically goes to your gas meter uh, and is something that you guys are probably familiar with. All right? So what the big picture of the gas situation looks like is the transmission gas comes into Walnut Creek. It comes into a regulator station at a high pressure. The regulator station drops that pressure down to 60 pounds. That's the uh, highest pressure that you're going to have in the plastic distribution system. From the 60 pounds, the gas comes into your gas meter. And we're going to talk a little bit about the meter and the valve and all that in a bit. 
But as it comes into the gas meter at 60 pounds, it goes through the shutoff valve, and we're going to talk a little bit about how to shut this off. Comes into your meter, the regulator on your meter now drops this pressure from 60 pounds down to a quarter pound of pressure, only 0.25 percent. And the reason is, is that your appliances can only handle a quarter pound of pressure. Anything more than that, such as a spike in the gas pressure, then what happens is your regulators on your appliances begin to leak and you, then you have leaks inside the home. That's, the, that's what we're trying to avoid here. So we're going to talk about how to, um, to come up to your neighbor after an earthquake to inspect the home, smell for gas, understand if you have a leak or not, what to do to mitigate that until the fire department can get there, until PG&E can get there, and then how you're going to move on from one building to the next and determine an evacuation area for, those, uh, for that area if you need, uh, need to because of a gas leak. So those are the things that we're going to be getting into in a few minutes. Again, our transmission pipe, steel pipe, 150 to 900 pounds. Our plastic pipe is going to be from a half inch, that's a little bit uh, off there, to 24 inches in diameter. So this plastic pipe will run from that regulator station that we were telling you about where it drops to low pressure and the large pipe runs down your neighborhood street. So you have this type of pipe down the street. And as it branches off into the neighborhood, we start dropping it down into that half inch plastic pipe. If you're in an older home, you may still have steel pipe three-quarter, maybe half-inch steel pipe. Uh, the homes in this area are probably going to be of uh, plastic variety because we stopped using the steel in about the 1960s. So let's talk a little bit about the gas uh, facilities in your area. If you want to know what's in your area, what the pipes look like, what the pressure is, you can go onto the website right here. This is a public website for anybody who wants to take a look at our gas facilities. That website is in your flip chart there also. We also provide a website for our firefighters. It's a more uh, detailed website, gives them location of valves, of um, shutoff meters, also uh, the opportunity for them to know the exact diameter and pressure of the pipe. That's not uh, information we give the general public for obvious uh, homeland security issues. I do want to uh, show you one of the maps for the Walnut Creek area, just so you have an understanding of what that looks like um, and, and where the gas is in this area. So, oops, let me move this out of the way here. So this is the, um, the downtown Walnut Creek area right here. This is the gas pipes that run through this area right here and in this lo location here. Uh, the blue lines here give you specific information regarding all of those pipelines. Uh, the pipelines uh, will tell, the information there will tell you the pipeline number. Each one of these is 191. This pipeline number is 3017. And then next to it is a date. The date tells you how old the pipe is when, we, uh, when we've upgraded it. Uh, some of the pipe is from 1960s. We have pipe from uh, most of that from 62, 2012. Some new pipe has gone in in this area over here. A little bit older over here as we get to 1951. That's pretty much uh, the, the, the norm uh, as far as the oldest pipe in, in this area right in here. Uh, Right here, this is the freeway, this is 680. Yeah. This drops off 680, this is 24. This is uh, Bancroft Village, this is you right here, right? And there's Ignatio, Ignatio. So this gas line runs down Ignatio Boulevard and it branches off as it goes over, the, um, uh, not Vasco, as it goes over, um, over Ignatio, over to Concord in uh, Pittsburgh area, it goes um, in that direction over there, okay? And this branch right here uh, ends up going down towards uh, Alamo and down towards San Ramon in that area down there. Is that where that gas blew from years ago? That, that, that so let's talk about, about that situation. That was not PG&E gas or gas pipeline. That was Kinder Morgan. Um, and just to give you a reference to what uh, PG&E has only natural gas. Kinder Morgan supplies petroleum products. So because we have a, um, a, an airport here and we have a lot of industry, we have sh all the refineries, all of those um, ship petroleum products. So everything from gasoline, diesel fuel to jet fuel. And that incident that happened on that pipeline, they were doing some work on the pipeline. It, uh, there were some residual um, fumes in there and it ignited through a welding torch. But that again was not PG&E uh, pipe si situation. A different type of pipe. Is that the same road? It does. It actually travels the same route along Highway 6 City all down in that area right there. And you'll find that's very typical with pipelines. They'll run along uh, major thoroughfares, railroad uh, areas, and, and they'll pu put them and cluster them together in the same uh, vicinity. Okay? Um, the pressure in these pipes, as you can see from the MOP, means the maximum operating pressure. 
It is about 338 pounds and it's actually that in all of the pipes in this area. And the outside diameter is 16 inches on this pipe and on this pipe it's only eight and a half inches. So again, just to give you an idea of what the uh, type of gas, transmission gas you have out here in comparison to San Bruno and everybody looks at that, right? 36 inch pipe, 350 pounds. You have 16 inch pipe at uh, 338 pounds. So about the same pressure but a much, uh, a little bit smaller pipeline, okay? All right, we're going to move out of this. If you want to look at this later at a break, um, I'm happy to bring that back up again for you. So there's another mapping system that you can look at. It's open to the public. It's called the National Pipeline Mapping System. So PG&E has our own website. We've given you that. The National Pipeline Mapping System is also in there, and that'll let you look at all underground hazardous materials in your, uh, in your city. So the, again, the Kinder Morgan Pipeline, you have petroleum products such as crude oil and uh, what they call um, uh, dirty oil, and then they have ammonia, they have hydrogen sulfide, and all these other hazardous materials. It's much cheaper and actually safer to uh, uh, ship those products underground through a pipeline than it is above ground on, in a truck system or a railroad system. So this is typically what happens when somebody digs into our pipe. They're doing a sewer replacement, contractor hits the gas pipe, and then what happens is the gas will blow up into the air. So 90% um, of our leaks are caused by somebody striking our pipelines. The good thing about an outside leak is that wind will take this gas because it's lighter than air and move it away pretty rapidly. So the gas on an outside leak, even outside of your home, typically doesn't get into the concentration level that's going to become ignitable. It's when it becomes into an enclosed space, the concentration level gets to that 5 to 15 percent, which is ignitable, that we have to be concerned about uh, there being a, a safety situation. A little bit about, um, about this also. As you can see, as the gas migrates in this area, one of the other things we're concerned about is if the contractor hits a, uh, a gas pipe, the gas under pressure can migrate underground through other utilities. So it does become uh, something that you need to be concerned about is that the gas might move into the homes underground and you may not be you know, even aware of it. So if somebody hits a pipe in your neighborhood underground uh, while they're uh, digging out in the street, Check on your neighbors. Do you have gas in their home? Do they smell any gas? It might be an indication the gas is migrating underground. You may not even know that there's a problem with that. So the properties of natural gas is, again, it's lighter than air. Um, we need to stay upwind from it. It's colorless and uh, tasteless. We have to add mercaptan. And if you haven't ever smelled mercaptan before or natural gas, this little scratch and sniff is just that. If you, if you move that around a little bit, you can smell that rotten egg smell. That's the mercaptan that we add to it. So we do that because the government says that we have to be able to smell natural gas when it's out of its container. That's important to know that you have a gas leak. So that's the smell you're looking for when you canvass your neighborhood to see if you have a person who has a gas leak either inside or outside their house. As far as the other problem with natural gas is it displaces the oxygen in a room. So if you go into your neighbor's house after an earthquake and you smell gas, you don't want to spend a lot of time in that, in that house looking for the valves or looking for anybody because now what's happening is the oxygen's being displaced out of there and now you're in an oxygen deficient atmosphere and you're going to become unconscious. You're going to be exposed also to carbon monoxide, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, unconsciousness, and eventually death if you're exposed to that for too long of a period. So again, going inside of a house and spending any length of time in there is, is something that you, you want to try to avoid. This is a um, video on lower the explosive lower explosive limit of natural gas. The upper limit is estimated to be around 15% natural gas concentration in the air. Within this 5 to 15 percent range of natural gas concentration lays the flammable range, meaning explosion is possible. Be aware that our captain odor is perceptible at 0.4 percent natural gas concentration in the air. Now that we know the explosive range, let's go over the practical use of this knowledge. It's vital to control natural gas content in the air in order to prevent the natural gas content rising to this explosive range. If the natural gas content becomes greater than 15%, it's out of the explosive range and may appear to be controlled and no longer a danger. However, as the natural gas content disperses or dissipates in the air, the concentration lowers and therefore must pass through the explosive range once again. It's extremely important for first responders to prepare for the second passage through the explosive range 
and take precautionary measures to protect themselves and the public. Finally, it's important to note that natural gas can displace oxygen at higher atmospheric levels. As such, natural gas can become a quicker asphyxiate at higher elevations. So there's two times when natural gas becomes dangerous to somebody that's uh, going inside of a building. The first time is when it first starts to fill up the house and it reaches what we call the lower explosive limit. That's 5% of, uh, of, of natural gas in the air. The other time is when it's already way above the 15%, the upper explosive limit, you start to open windows and doors and now the gas starts to drop and become down to that 15% where it becomes explosive also. So something to think about. If you're going to, after an earthquake or a, a situation where you need to canvas your neighborhood, first again, make sure that you're working in pairs, that you have good communications with team leaders and your incident commander. Once you get out there, you want to go to the outside of the building. What you want to do is smell for gas. And you're not going to have a gas detector, so you're going to use your nose. One of the other important things about natural gas is if your nose is exposed to natural gas for too long of a period, that mercaptan will actually desensitize your nose. So again, be careful how long you're going to be inside a building and as uh, exposed to that, that um, mercaptan smell that we have. All right. As you start to smell mercaptan at 0.4 percent, it starts to get um, into a situation on a gas monitor, if you had it, where it would start to alarm. It becomes what we call Cal OSHA um, uh, un unhealthy for you. So what we want to know is that if you start to smell gas, chances are you probably are already in an environment that's not going to be um, good for you to be in because it becomes explosive and can be, uh, and can be toxic to you. So what we're going to do is when we start to understand that we have a gas smell, we're going to knock on the door, we're going to make sure that nobody's inside, and then we're going to try to open up all the windows. The first thing we're going to do, though, is call PG&E, and then we're going to shut off the valve to the gas meter. We always want to do that whether you're, uh, when you think that you have a gas leak. You never want to shut off a gas valve if you don't smell natural gas. And the reason is who likes to go without hot water and uh, so forth for, for a week on end because PG&E is you know, very busy, especially after an earthquake, and we're not going to get there to be able to turn your gas back on. In the event of a natural gas leak, you may see the following signs. Dirt being blown into the air, dead or dying vegetation, flames coming from the ground, continuous bubbling in puddles, construction and or excavation equipment. You may also see signage or pipeline markings indicating a natural gas line location nearby. In the event of a natural gas incident, you may hear distinct sounds, including one of two unique roaring sounds. In an incident where a transmission line is leaking, you may hear a very loud roar, similar to the sound of a jet engine or a train. The other roaring sound you may hear is a loud roar from several hundred feet away, which would most likely indicate a leaking distribution line. Also, listen closely for hissing or whistling sounds, often coming from service and appliance releases. A word of caution, there may be no perceptible sound, even if a natural gas leak is present. Okay, so the signs are going to be the dirt's going to be moving around. You're going to hear the noise. The noise level is really important. If you hear um, the noise level at about the level of a barbecue uh, propane tank that's being opened up, that's going to mean you're on our low pressure uh, distribution system. That means it's probably uh, a, a much less of an emergency than it would be in our transmission system. However, if it hurt, uh, sounds like a jet engine going off, you, you can't talk to somebody standing next to you very, very loud, um, you're going you're gonna to know that that's a transmission leak. High pressure and a much more uh, volume of natural gas. Uh, when our companies responded to San Bruno, they said that they were three or four blocks away from the uh, leak itself and they couldn't talk to each other, even that distance away because of the level of noise. So that's a very good indicator that you have a transmission versus a distribution system uh, situation and you want to be uh, able to tell PG&E that. So giving that information to us on that 1-800 uh, number is very important. Uh, other things you may see are uh, fire that doesn't uh, look like a normal uh, grass or wood fire. It's going to be cement burning, asphalt burning, something unusual like that, and, and you don't really have a uh, fuel source other than the natural gas that's coming from underneath the ground. Uh, bubbling of the water when we have a wet day or, or we have uh, pipelines underneath the water system is an indicator you have a gas leak. Um, and so that's, those are the things that you're looking for. 
Other things you can do is, uh, are to control the ignition sources uh, in that home that you're going to go check on. So once you, uh, after an earthquake, you're gonna canvas your neighborhood, you smell some gas in somebody's house, before you even uh, make entry, you shut off the gas, you wanna think about these ignition sources that are important to you because they can cause a gas explosion when you enter the house. Some of the things you need to think about, the radios that you use. You guys have the little walkie-talkie type radios? If you use those inside a room full of gas, when you key the mic, it creates an arc across the battery and that can actually create an explosion. Uh, the radios that the fire departments use, if they're not intrinsically safe, they'll do the same thing. So we tell them, if you're going to talk to somebody or you need to communicate with them, go outside the building, face-to-face -face communications, uh, and don't use a radio system like that. Um, the other thing is a flashlight. How many of you have intrinsically safe flashlights in, in your cache or in, with you um, if you're going to be doing a search? Really important because they're a little bit more expensive, 30, 40 bucks, but intrinsically safe means that they won't allow gas to get inside the flashlight. Because what happens with a non-intrinsically safe flashlight is once it gets permeated with gas and you turn on that switch, boom, you're going to have an explosion because the battery arcs across that. So if you don't have an intrinsic, uh, intrinsically safe flashlight, you still can use it, but you have to think about how you're going to use it. Turn it on outside. Bring it in the building, do what you need to do, and then go back outside to turn it off. You don't want to manipulate the switch uh, inside the building full of gas. Okay? Uh, other things, light switches. If you go into your neighbor's house and you turn on the light switch, uh, there's an opportunity there also for ignition. So the gas likes to accumulate inside the walls, inside the electrical conduit, at the electrical panel. So you don't want to turn light switches on or off. If the electricity is on, leave it on. If it's off, leave it off. Don't turn the electricity off at the panel um, where the gas meter is because what's going to happen is if you have gas in there, there's going to be a spark inside the electrical box and that's going to create that ignition that you're going to be concerned about. Uh, doorbells. Where's the doorbell in most homes located? In the hallway at the ceiling typically, right? Um, when you ring the doorbell, what happens inside that little door, uh, doorbell box? You get a little arc. Where does gas like to accumulate? It's lighter than air. It's going to go to the ceiling, right? So you don't want to ring a doorbell when you go check on your neighbor. Knock on the door, because if there is gas in there, there's an, another opportunity for have, to have that explosion situation. Uh, the other thing that, that uh, is important is static electricity. The ignition temperature of natural gas is 1,100 degrees. Because of that, it's, it's static electricity is about 1,100 degrees. So when you walk into a building and you walk across a carpet, we all know that little jolt you get when you have a static charge, that can ignite gas also in that environment. So don't walk across the carpet if you can help it. Come across a linoleum or a wood floor if you need to get inside the building to look for somebody or to turn an appliance off. Or um, better yet, if you have to go in there, wear uh, leather or uh, some type of glove, not plastic, but, but some other type of glove. That'll keep that static charge from leaving your fingers and touching or being exposed to that gas environment. Okay? Any questions on ignition sources? Yeah, good point. Is it listed up there? Boy, you must have seen our slide before. Motion detectors um, are, are uh, a problem too. So when you walk up to your neighbor and all of a sudden the lights kick on, that's an opportunity if there's gas outside of the building um, or near the building to ignite an, uh, that also. So again, you, don't, you, tr you want to try not to walk in that area where that's going to happen. Um, there's really no solution for you to take care of that problem in advance. Did you have a question? Well, yeah, there was a thing about cell phones at gas stations. Same thing. Same thing, if you use your cell phone inside of a building to communicate rather than your phone, your cell phone has a battery in it. So when you get that ring, you, you know, you're going to have that same uh, situation. So leave your cell phones off uh, while you're inside of a building doing a search like that, just for that reason right there. And at a gas station, right? And at a gas station because of the static charge. At a gas station, what happens is the gasoline uh, produces fumes, and those fumes can accumulate, and if you're on your phone, that can be an ignition source with that. Yeah. Okay. One of the other things we want to talk about real quickly uh, is the USA 811. How many know what that's, what that's all about? Okay. Has anybody used it before? Oh, yeah. Call before you dig. Call before you dig. Thank you. That would be great. $45 million a year in damage to our gas lines. Who do you think pays for that? Consumer. Consumer. Yeah, not PG&E. Are you kidding me? Um, so what you're supposed to do is if you're going to be digging in your front yard or even your backyard, you call 811. The operator will tell you to mark the area in white chalk, white paint, flour, whatever the case is going to be. You're going to mark the area that you're going to be digging in. Once that mark is on the ground, 
the utility companies have 48 hours to come out and mark where all of the pipelines are. We color code the pipelines. So in here, the red lines means electricity, the yellow means gas. So those are the PG&E utilities. Blue is water, orange is uh, communications, green is sewer. You've probably seen this paint on the ground all over the place, right? So that's what you're supposed to do by law. If you don't do this, we can fine you, we can make you uh, liable for all the damages. We sent a bill um, just this last summer to a farmer in Bakersfield for hitting one of our large 36-inch transmission lines of a million dollars. And he had, he had to pay a million dollars, his insurance paid a million dollars uh, to PG&E for restoration. So the other problem is, if you, or thing to be aware of, if somebody's digging out here and they hit a gas line and we have red paint on the ground, what does that mean? We have electrical lines. That's an ignition source. So we, uh, you would want to call us and go, we've got a gas leak out here. I see red paint on the, on the ground. We need to shut the electricity off. And PG&E, in a lot of instances, especially in Concord Walnut Creek, we can now do that remotely by just pushing a button or on your smart meters using a uh, remote to be, uh, be able to turn those off. Well, at yeah. one time they were trying, they were pushing uh, automatic meters and they had an earthquake or something like that. The yeah. earthquake valve? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Has that proven to be more of a nuisance than a help? Yeah, I have a slide on it and, and I'll tell you PG&E's perspective is that they're neutral on the earthquake valve. I'll show you the slide as far as, far as what the valve looks like. We'll talk a little bit about it. Um, it's mandatory in a lot of cities, for especially for new construction or retrofitting. If you've ever had to pull a permit for any, um, you know, remodeling or something like that, typically they're going to say you need to have a gas meter um, earthquake valve in that. Well, let me get to, get to that rod in a minute. But but PG&E doesn't uh, really want to tell you yes or no. They can be overly sensitive and create false alarms and shut your gas off uh, when when you really don't have a gas leak situation. I'll, I'll explain that to you in a minute. All of our gas transmission pipes are marked above ground. You've probably seen these, typically this placard will be along the freeway somewhere, up in the hills where our pipes go, you know, transmission pipes go um, uh, over in the wide open spaces. If you don't see those placards, you'll see something like this. Um, you see these downtown on the sidewalks or um, in the center, center divide. The pipeline itself is directly underneath this, this marker, and the next marker is going to be in line of sight. And the marker will tell you who owns the pipeline. So it'll say Kinder Morgan. It'll say petroleum products, so the, the commodity. And it'll give you an 800 number to call in the event that there's a problem like this. So after an earthquake, if you see something leaking out of a pipeline, look for a marker and call that number uh, for that particular pipeline company and notify them they've got a problem on their uh, pipeline system. So a couple of things um, about being at the scene. Again, we, we looked at this. There's a couple of other areas that are dangerous for you. If you're out and about, uh, and you're, you smell gas in their neighborhood, you might have an underground gas leak and gas could be in the sewer system. We talked about that. If this gas ignites, you don't want to park over the manhole cover or you don't want to walk near the manhole covers. You don't want to stand around them, set your command post up out in the street on a manhole cover. So manhole covers are a bad thing, both for electricity and for gas. Stay away from those. Give yourself a bit of a perimeter from those, okay? Because if you have an explosion, uh, that 250-pound manhole cover is going to hurt. They go flying. They, they, we had a, um, a, a, a young lady killed in San Francisco uh, from a, a vault explosion. The manhole cover came down and, and um, uh, killed her. So, th yeah, they can be very dangerous. What creates an explosion in a vault? Uh, the electricity itself does that. And then because of the transformers that are in there, there's oil. And then there's all these plastics from the uh, insulators. And those start to burn. Uh, so, and because the vault's a, an enclosed space, that electricity has nowhere else to go but through that open manhole or through the manhole cover and it'll blow it right off the top there. They seem to have quite a few in San Francisco. Yeah, San Francisco has a lot of huge vaults. A lot of their vaults are bigger than this room. Uh, we've had people living them, homo, uh, homeless people, people stealing our copper, things like that. They're not a good place to be. Obviously, the, the danger is 500 volts and so forth. Um, and we'll get to that in the electric side of this, but, but they're very dangerous. And, and it, for that reason, the manhole covers in the sewer system during an earthquake or after an earthquake can be the same way if we have gas on, in the underground system. This book right here, the Emergency Response Guide, it's the same book that firefighters and police officers use in the field uh, to determine uh, some basic uh, information about how to deal with a hazardous materials. Natural gas is a hazardous material. So with that being said, this is a very easy book to use. It's color coded, which I always say is firefighter friendly, so the pages are easy to read. Good information in, in there, right, Rod? Firefighter friendly. We know that term. It's really easy. Really easy. If Rod can learn it, anybody can learn it, trust me. 
Uh, this is what it looks like as a hard copy. They typically are free through your local uh, emergency off, uh, Office of Emergency Services. You can uh, download this as an app on your cell phone or your iPad. And what I, uh, what I encourage you to do is, is get some of these and look at them and study a little bit about how they're used. So typically what we, we're looking at here is the yellow section will tell you a, um, a number that's associated with a chemical. So you see the trucks that are driving around, the big tanker trucks, they have a placard, the number is on there. That number corresponds to a chemical. So if you know the number, you can look at the chemical. Or if you know the chemical uh, name, you can just look it up by name. And what it happens is each one of these chemicals refers you to a guide. The guide will tell you what to do with that particular chemical. So natural gas is in here. So with natural gas, what it tells you is that you need to have an evacuation distance of 330 feet for an outside gas leak. So again, after an earthquake, you smell gas, you see a gas line that's ruptured, there's gas coming out of the ground. 330 feet is how far you want to keep people away from that. You don't want them to get any closer than that. Eliminate the ignition sources. If the gas is inside of a house, shut the meter off, open the windows, check for anybody inside there, make sure nobody's inside, have pg and &E respond, and the fire department. Don't forget, when you're calling for a gas leak, don't forget the fire department, because they will probably be there before pg and &E. okay? The other things that, that are on here are good, uh, other basic information about first aid uh, to the exposure for that chemical, um, how to protect yourself as far as the equipment or, or clothing you need to wear, um, how to put out a small fire if it's a, it's a hazard materials and things like that. Very much uh, a very good reference for the general layperson. I recommend it for your CERT group as a good um, book and a resource for you for um, leaks of hazardous materials. So this video is a, a video with an outside gas leak. This is a, um, a um, leak out here. That's the first ignition source. And then look, look for the uh, other ignition source right there. So again, electricity will create ignition. Your vehicle will also create ignition if your vehicle is too close to that gas environment. So you need to be cautious of that. Again, we want 330 feet. This is an outside gas leak, very open area. The gas should be uh, able to escape out of here pretty rapidly. But if you bring your vehicle into this area or you're dry letting other vehicles drive around, oh that's an ignition potential. Yeah, at least half a block. On, about a half a block distance gives you a, a good reference um, to how far you need to have for a gas leak. Okay. Now, 330 feet on a gas leak at the, at the gas meter on a half inch pipe is more than enough. 100 feet is going to be plenty of room for, for that because, again, the gas is lighter than air. It's going to go out. It's going to blow away. But if you have a gas, a house filled with gas, 330 feet. If you have a big gas leak outside on a large pipe, 330 feet. Again, you need to be uh, cautious of other types of ignition sources. You have a gas leak here. This is an electrical box, and the electrical box, because of the fumes in the air, uh, will ignite that also. Not much you're going to be able to do about that, but again, when you start to think about your perimeter, don't uh, allow anybody to get into an area where you have electrical boxes and a gas leak and those types of things combined, because that can be an electrical problem, or excuse me, an ignition problem. So let's talk a little bit about um, our, our valves and how, you, how you're going to deal with that. So everybody, has anybody not ever shut off a uh, gas meter valve? Everybody shut one off. You guys, do, you guys have not Okay, good. So I'll explain it anyway. I was going to do it whether you raise your hand or not, but that's okay. Um, so if you haven't done this before, it's a good thing to do. I caution you, though, don't go shut your meter off because then your pilot lights go out and we have to come back out and, and re-ignite. You know, we do that for free, by the way. Uh, so if you make that mistake, we can do that. But what you can do um, is exercise your valve, and that doesn't happen very often. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, things that you need to think about. So when the valve is on, it's going to be in this position right here, straight up and down, in line with the pipe. This is the valve right here. Okay. So when you go home and it's light, look outside. That means your gas is on. Get a, a picture of that. You want to see what that looks like. Find the valve. Some of the meters, the valve might be uh, in, the, in this direction coming up into the meter. It might be at the ground level. So you want to locate the valve and be sure you understand what that looks like. Okay? When we turn it off, what we're going to do is turn this 90 degrees. We can turn it to the left 90 degrees, or we can turn it to the right 90 degrees. This valve goes 360 degrees. So in reality, it's on, off, on, off. When you do turn it off, make sure it's exactly at 90 degrees, because if I leave it like this, 
it's still going to leak into the house. You haven't turned your gas off. Okay? So 90 degrees. I'm going to give you another hint. I can guarantee you, looking at the age of the homes in the area, that some of these valves are not going to move when you put your wrench on them. Right? So that can be a problem. We don't typically exercise this valve. Um, it's a, one of the things that we're working on as a company. But if you go out to your valve and you put the, um, a crescent wrench on it like this, and I'll tell you why I recommend this, um, and you can't move it at all, don't go get a bigger wrench and put more weight on it and you know, do all that stuff because if you break this brass valve, you now have a 60 pound gas leak at this outside of your house. That can be very dangerous, right? So what you can do though, and do this in an emergency, you don't need to do this now. You take your crescent wrench on the back side over here on the nut, another crescent wrench on the front, and you just crack the nut a quarter turn. And when you do that, it loosens this valve up in here. Now it's easy for you to come over here, turn the valve off, but then you need to come back and tighten the nut back up so that this doesn't fly off because of the pressure behind it and now you still have a, that 60 PSI gas leak, okay? Now again, only do this in an emergency if you can't move your valve. If you go home and you want to go check your valve, take your wrench on it like this, try to move it around back and forth a little bit. You're not shutting the gas off, so you're not going to shut off your um, pilot lights, but you're going to realize my, my, meter, my valve needs to be um, serviced. Call us, we'll come out, we'll probably actually replace it with a new valve which is a stainless steel valve, which is non, doesn't need a, um, any grease or any other maintenance on it, and then now you're going to be set for life kind of thing. All right, so that, that's something for all of you to check when you get home. Check your neighbors, talk about um, that, and, and have an idea of how you're going to do that. Also have a wrench, something to turn that off. Now, um, you've probably all seen uh, wrenches like this. You can buy the fancy wrenches at most of the hardware stores, right? Uh, about 25, 30 bucks, maybe online you'll get it for 20 bucks. Uh, these are okay, but there's a little bit of a problem. I have found several of these wrenches that when you put them on, they don't fit, right? This doesn't change. The problem is that some of these wrenches aren't actually manufactured correctly. Now, you could probably get it to fit a little bit, but it's going to slide off. So, uh, again, because of the ability of a crescent wrench to manipulate the, the nut in the back, I recommend one of these. You use them for a lot of other things too, so you don't, there's no additional expense to um, you know, buy a wrench solely for um, your, your uh, gas valve here. Hang this out, uh, inside the garage so it doesn't get any rust on it uh, in the weather and so forth on a nail. Um, check it once in a while, make sure it works, put a little bit of oil on it and you're good to go. Okay, any questions about the valve? We don't want you shutting off any other valves in our system. The, there are street valves, there's valves in, under, in the street or in the sidewalk that are in a cement cover or something like that. Um, when you pull those off, you'll see the valve there. If you go to shut that valve off, what's gonna, several things are going to happen. First of all, you're not going to just shut off the house that you're trying to shut off. You're going to shut off probably the entire neighborhood, which is not good. All right? The second thing that's going to happen is you're going to spike the pressure because just like um, a hydrant or water uh, pressure, when you sh slam the faucet on your uh, water and you get that bang in your pipes, gas will do the same thing. It spikes the pressure, it damages the pipes, um, and it'll also pop all of those appliance regulators in the neighborhood. So um, just to give you a story about that, 1994, city of uh, Alameda, they had uh, PG&E came out and then we, uh, the person that was working there manipulated a regulator incorrectly, spiked the pressure. Um, city of Berkeley and all the other local Alameda cities, uh, Alameda County cities sent uh, automatic aid. I, I responded as a truck company out there. And uh, what had happened was they had 11 structure fires in 10 minutes because all the gas was leaking, they started igniting, and we had all these fires going on at the same time. So uh, kind of like the Oakland Hills, that's kind of what it looked like, everything burning at once, right? But um, you don't want to do that in your neighborhood. That's probably not the right way to deal with that. So don't manipulate the valves, okay? Um, I always do this. I set it down and can't find it. <laughs> Help. There it is. Okay, found it. Um, you can isolate gas inside the building by shutting off appliances uh, at the appliance. By building code, every appliance, appliance has to have its own quarter uh, turn shutoff valve. So I also recommend you go home and find these at your gas appliances. Your gas stove will have it, your gas heater will have it, your, um, uh, what else, your water heater will have it. So look for the valve, looks some, something like this. If it's an, a newer valve, if it's an older valve, it might look like something like this. It's a quarter turn valve. A lot of people are painting them red, showing their kids, making sure everybody in the house knows where these are at, and also manipulate it. 
Make sure it's working for you, right? That you can get to it. Um, because what's going to happen is if you have, we have an earthquake, you go outside you, to your neighbor's house, you don't smell any gas, the gas meter's not leaking, you knock on the door, check on your neighbor, and you smell gas inside, there's an opportunity for you to go uh, into the, in these different areas where these appliances are and isolate just that appliance first. If you do that, now you've allowed gas to go to their water heater while you shut their stove off, or vice versa, they can still use their appliances. If you're not sure where the gas is leaking from, absolutely, turn it off outside. But if you know it's, it's because the stove is on its side, the pipe is broken off there, you can shut it off right imme immediately at that one valve right there. Okay? Again, the gas meter shut off is right here. Gas comes in through the valve. The valve is usually going to be located near the ground level. On occasion, the pipe may come in from this direction. It might be at this level over here. This is the regulator that changes that from 60 pounds to a quarter pound of pressure. As the gas goes into this area, the, these meters, these dials right here will calculate how much gas you, you're using. Another tip, if you go to your neighbor's house and you see any one of these dials spinning like crazy after an earthquake, they have a gas leak inside. Something's broken, uh, fall, fallen off the, the uh, gas line, and now it's uh, free-flowing inside the house. So turn the meter off and don't go in the house. You need to ventilate that house or get some windows open uh, before we can um, get in there safely and do a search. So this is your earthquake valve. Uh, again, this valve is not a PG&E valve. It's attached to this side of the meter, so that's the customer side of the meter. It belongs to you. If you have a valve like this, you probably want to know how to um, reset it, how to use it, right? So what you want to do is go outside, look at the valve, find the name of it, Google it. Google's great. And it'll walk you through the process of resetting each valve. There's about 12 different uh, varieties of valves uh, in California alone. This particular one, if you have one like this, is called a Costco valve, K-O-S-C-O -S -S valve. Um, and this is one, I, I have one like this. So the valve itself, uh, is the, sh re the uh, reset is right going to be on the side over here. On all of your other valves, it'll look similar to this. It'll be a slotted screwdriver. There'll be a reset or on-off indicator. And if you look at the valve, it means that the uh, earthquake valve is tripped if it's in the off position. So two things to think about. You go to your neighbor, maybe we've had an earthquake. You don't have gas uh, anymore. You can't turn on your appliance with no gas. You think you have a gas leak, right? Go outside. As long as the, um, the valve here is still on, look at your earthquake valve. If you look at your earthquake valve and this is in the, in the off position, this has been activated. All this really is is a flapper valve that seismically um, is activated and then just shuts off as it falls on top of the pipe here. When you reset the lever, it just pops it back off. The problem with that afterwards is now you have gas flowing back to the house, you have to relight all the appliances. You can call PG&E to help you through, to do that. You can call a plumber to do that. If you don't know how to do it yourself, I recommend you do one of those. If you know how to do it, or, uh, some now, now most newer appliances are automatic ignition or auto ignition, so they um, will do that themselves. Once they detect gas again through the regulator, they'll start to light again. So know your appliance. Do you have that type? Do you not have that type? Those types of things. Okay. <coughs> we talked about um, shut off valves. Okay, so some of the first things you need to think about. Um, the first action on the scene is check for your own safety, right? Make sure you're okay, your family's okay. Get, get your safety equipment on. You, you guys have a cache of equipment, things that you need to be wearing, helmets, gloves, goggles, things like that, right? Dress appropriately when you're going to start to get out there and do things. You don't want to go out in flip-flops and shorts uh, and canvas the neighborhood because that's not a safe thing to be in, especially if you're going to get inside of buildings and, and do those types of things, right? Again, follow your safety uh, communication protocols, whatever channels you're going to be on. Exercise that. I really recommend that you set up some type of a drill where you're shutting off gas meters, where you're doing uh, some of the things that we're talking about, you know, looking at the neighborhood, looking at the, um, the, where the valve locations are, where the uh, meters are, and things like that. So you become real familiar with your neighbors. Okay, we are done with gas. Want to move on to electricity? You want to take about a five-minute break and get some air and move around a little bit?